Good afternoon. Uh, I'm Steve Morrison from CSIS, and thank you all for joining us um, this afternoon. Uh, we're really thrilled to have the leadership from the AIDS 2012 <coughs> conference with us here today. Chris uh, Byrer from Johns Hopkins University and um, Diane Havlier from UCSF. Um, they have um, uh, uh, taken this leadership role in preparing for AIDS 2012, the conference that will be held here July 22 to 27 of this year, returning to the United States uh, after a 22-year hiatus. We're even more thrilled that today that we can, that we can welcome into CSIS four key personalities uh, from America and from the faith-based community who've been at the forefront of, of, of putting in place um, health programs uh, uh, and uh, have been willing to come and join us here today to talk in some depth about their achievements, about the assets that they bring, about the partnerships that they've forged over time and how they see the future. This gives us also an opportunity to talk in a very positive way about the upcoming um, AIDS 2012 conference, which is going to put a spotlight on the role and the contr special contributions the faith community has made in this area. Um, and, and so we're bringing these two streams together uh, very deliberately here today. Um, I also want to add this is not meant to be a one-off um, single uh, event uh, in this process. We hope that we'll be uh, in the lead up to the July conference convening again and have the opportunity uh, to engage um, other faiths uh, and, 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 and other folks from the Christian community that we did not bring here today, including black church community in America. Um, we uh, had hoped that Bertrand Odin, um, the, the head of the International AIDS Secretariat, would be with us today. Uh, uh, he made a special uh, journey from Geneva to be here uh, yesterday, but he's uh, become ill, uh, unfortunately, and uh, cannot be with us for this event and sends his regrets, and we'll do our best to try and get him here in the near future uh, when he's feeling better. Um, I want to also thank many of my colleagues who've made this uh, event possible. Um, uh, Julia Nagel, this is being uh, webcast live. We've solicited a number of questions online already that will be incorporated into the discussion. Uh, Matt Fisher, um, uh, Suzanne Brundage, Carolyn uh, Schrote, Robert Lee, thanks to all of you. Uh, for your help here. What we're going to do is we're going to ha have some, some uh, early welcoming remarks uh, from Diane Havler uh, and from um, uh, Chris Bayer. Uh, Chris is just back from Burma, and we, we thought that was a very good occasion to hear uh, some thoughts around the faith community in Burma and some of the changes, very promising changes he's observed. Um, that'll take a few minutes, and then we'll move to uh, what is meant to be a very lively, interactive, conversational uh, roundtable uh, with Kay Warren from Saddleback Church, Ken Hackett from Catholic Relief Services, Anita Smith, Children's AIDS Fund, and Ken Hill from World Vision. Diane will do the introductions uh, of our guests. I want to single out Shep uh, <clears throat> Shepard Smith for his kind and very activist approach in helping us pull all of this together today. So please join me in welcoming um, Diane Havler from UCSF, who's going to uh, uh, deliver, uh, kick the event off and get things going. Thank you. So thanks very much, Steve. Thanks to all of you who are here. Thanks to um, Suzanne for putting together this really uh, exciting session this afternoon. Um, uh, this summer um, in July, July 22nd through 27th, over 25,000 delegates, including over 2,500 press, are going to be gathered here in Washington, D.C. for the International AIDS Conference. Um, the International AIDS Conference is really like no other. It is the only health issue where every two years there is an annual gathering of the scientists, the policymakers, the community leaders, the persons living with the disease, economists, political scientists, they all come together to talk about how we can work together to define the AIDS response. 
The impact of this meeting is always just absolutely tremendous. Um, this meeting has shaped the AIDS response. In 2000, the theme of the meeting was break the silence, and it was the moment the globe came together and decided that we were going, that we could and we would offer treatment to every person that we could living with HIV. At the meeting, just to give you a little sense of what we do, is we take stock of the epidemic. We look at the trends, what's happening in terms of the numbers of two new cases, where are they happening. We showcase the latest science. And we discuss and we debate the best ways for us to go forward in terms of the AIDS response. As Steve had mentioned, it's a historical meeting in that it's going to be occurring in the United States. The International AIDS Society requires that the host city or host country um, does not have a ban against enter allowing people with HIV to enter the country, and that ban that we had in the United States was fortunately lifted in the last year in order that we could host the conference here in the United States. So clearly, this is one of the first uh, uh, products of this meeting, which is a human rights victory and we shouldn't underestimate that. This meeting is also going to be historic because we are at a time in the AIDS epidemic that we have never been before. Because of all the research investment of the United States and really countries around the world, we have a whole new set of tools and some new exciting data that lead us to believe that we can change um, the face of the AIDS epidemic over the next decade. And specifically, over this last summer, there was some groundbreaking data uh, that were released that showed this not only does HIV treatment help save lives and reduce suffering, but it also reduces HIV transmission between couples of 97%. And we're still pinching ourselves about the results of this study, but now the real work begins because we have to figure out how to apply this new exciting results. It's also historic because we used to be afraid to talk about the cure for HIV, and now scientists have made new breakthroughs, and now this is a very exciting dialogue that we're going to be having, and we're going to have a pre-meeting uh, before the International AIDS Conference um, starts. And also, um, we're now talking about things like HIV and aging, something that we never before we envisioned that we would be talking about. The excitement and the momentum that's being generated for this meeting, I think, was reflected in uh, Hillary Clinton's uh, uh, really brilliant speech that she delivered in November of this year, where, for those of you who attended, she called for an AIDS-free generation. <coughs> this was followed shortly on World AIDS Day in December by another just absolutely inspiring speech by our own president, which talked about our country's commitment to ending the AIDS epidemic and our commitment to ramping up treatment to try to reach six million people through the PEPFAR program by 2013. One of the key questions that we are going to be addressing in the International AIDS Conference is how do we take this new knowledge and apply it in an era of uh, economic restraints? Uh, most of us in this room can't really change uh, quickly what's happening with the economy. But I would argue most of us who are working in the AIDS movement can change how we approach the question of going forward. And I think we're going to need to think about new models, and these new models include many different things, such as increasing the efficiency of what we do, improving healthcare systems and integrating with other communicable and non-communicable diseases, and reaching out to new partners. The theme of the world of, world of the International AIDS Conference is turning the tide together. And what this session today is focused on is the together part of turning the tide. We know that we are not going to be able to use all the tools we have, all the the knowledge that we have now to turn the tide without us having new models for collaboration. The faith-based community, and we're going to see some of the most prominent leaders in the United States, if not the world, here with us today, have been involved in the AIDS response ever since it started. In fact, the faith-based community has been involved in response to diseases of vulnerable and affected populations long before the AIDS epidemic began. Their work is going to be absolutely key to the response as AIDS as we go forward. Really, when you think about it, 
a lot of the principles of why PEPFAR and how PEPFAR was rooted was rooted in the principles of a faith-based community. And this is something that has resulted in the saving of millions of lives. Early in the 1980s, when I was a, a, a physician in my formative years in San Francisco, uh, right when the AIDS epidemic was breaking, we had our own version of leprosy. Young men were walking around in the halls of our hospital and every street in the Castro district with disfiguring purple lesions on their face, on their mouth, on their hands, and on their feet. And when I was a physician in San Francisco, I really learned a lot about the technical aspects of medicine, which has served me well. But what I really learned in San Francisco in that time was about compassion. And I really learned watching the patients, watching the communities about putting compassion into action. And that is, I think, really one of the hallmarks of faith-based organizations, what they have done for this epidemic. So Steve asked me to comment on what our vision was for the International AIDS Conference. And I, I think it is to take the new knowledge that we have bring all the individuals at the table, including and especially the face-based communities, to realize what we can do for the AIDS epidemic and truly make it the moment that we mark as the beginning of the end of the AIDS epidemic. So I want to thank you uh, for your attention. Um, I'm looking forward to the session this afternoon. And I'm now going to turn the microphone over to Professor Chris Baer um, from Johns Hopkins University, who will be the officially the president-elect of the International AIDS Society announced in Washington this summer. So thank you, Chris. Well, thanks, Diane. Good afternoon, everyone. I uh, must apologize. I got a cold on one of the five flights <laughs> that, uh, that it took to get here, and uh, so my voice is a little off. Um, what, I, what I thought I would do in talking with, uh, with Steve and Diane is uh, share with you some, some uh, reflections on uh, my uh, recent trip to Burma, also known as Myanmar. Uh, and because I've been involved with that country uh, for just about 20 years now, uh, talk a little bit about the role that the faith-based communities have played there um, in regards to HIV, but also more broadly, because they've been so critical, they've been so essential, and I think it's one of those uh, examples of where uh, uh, the spiritual traditions and the spiritual communities are really essential for people in the toughest kinds of situations. Um, so. Uh, one of the things, of course, that's just happened recently, for those of you who are following this, you know that um, about 10 days ago now uh, was a, a large release of uh, prisoners of conscience, political prisoners from Burma, and it was so heartening. Uh, and when that list came out, um, you know, many of us were looking very carefully to see who was there, and one of the people who was there um, was somebody that I, I have been uh, campaigning for the release of since since he was arrested. And so I'll just tell you a little little story that will illustrate exactly what I'm saying. So in this country, of course, there's very limited access to antiviral therapy. And we don't know the exact numbers because the surveillance is so poor, but somewhere less, certainly less than one in five Burmese who needs antiviral therapy gets it. So it's still a place where the majority of people uh, die of untreated HIV disease. And that means, of course, that there is a substantial need for hospice care and for care of people who are really, really quite ill. And the uh, Buddhist monasteries in the Buddhist parts of the country, in many cases, have stepped up to the plate and really, uh, really worked on that. And a large one, just outside of the old capital, Rangoon, was a place called Magan Monastery. And the abbot of that monastery was a man named uh, the Venerable U Indaka, and who's a man in his 40s, uh, a very progressive person, and really uh, set up a, a tremendously effective uh, wraparound service of AIDS, uh, basic AIDS care, a support, uh, stigma reduction programs, and a hospice setting. Um, but he also is, like many uh, of the monks, a, a person involved in human rights and democracy. And so, as many of you will remember, 2007, there was this tremendous uh, uprising uh, of the clergy of all faiths, but certainly uh, most prominently 
uh, the Buddhist clergy in what was called the Saffron Revolution, September and October of 2007. Uh, which was brutally uh, crushed by the then military government. Uh, Magan Monastery was raided, the patients were thrown out onto the street, and the people in the surrounding community were told that they must not help those people or take them in, or they too would face severe consequences. Uh, the monks were arrested and detained, and Uindaka uh, was jailed uh, and forcibly disrobed, which actually is sort of not allowed to be done, but anyway, that's, that's what the military did. Um, he maintained his practice uh, for the next uh, four years or so in very, very tough prison conditions. Uh, we were greatly concerned about him. There was congressional hearings this summer on the transition in Burma. I was a, a witness in those hearings, and that was actually the first appearance of Aung San Suu Kyi, uh, the uh, Nobel uh, Peace Prize winner in the U.S. Congress. She, she spoke via videotape, uh, and we again raised the issue of this man and the other monks and you know, called uh, for their uh, immediate and unconditional release. Uh, so imagine my delight uh, to find out that he's been freed. So that's a great thing, and it illustrates, I think, hopefully the change that's happening in this country uh, and also really the central role that the faith-based community has played. Um, I have to say that there is somewhat of a more troubling concern, which is that Burma is a, is a multi-ethnic country and a multi-religious country, uh, and uh, large parts of the country, particularly in the north but also in the west, uh, are heavily, uh, uh, predominantly Christian. And one of the larger ethnic groups that lives in the whole north of the country on the border with China is the Kachins. Uh, and the Kachins had a long-standing ceasefire with the military. That has broken down. The new uh, civilian government called for an immediate cessation to violence, uh, and unfortunately the army disregarded them. So that's a real concern, you know. <laughs> You have a civilian government, you would like them to be able to control the military. That's kind of not what's happening. The best uh, accounting is that there are some 60,000 internally displaced Kachin civilians right now, so that is really getting to be a substantial humanitarian uh, crisis. Uh, the uh, military has allowed one UN convoy in. They distributed 300 blankets. So uh, we have ways to go there. and. Uh, and right now, honestly, the only groups that are there and have access to those people are the churches, are the, are the churches of the Kachin people and the pastors. There, and there really is no one, as they say, between the dog and the wolf for those people except the churches. And uh, so they, again, are playing just a critical role. And it should be said, unfortunately, again, the data are very spotty, but as far as we can tell, and my own group has done this and, and a number of others have, have looked at it, uh, Kachin State has the highest HIV rate in the country, largely due to injection drug use. Uh, and so there are an enormous number of untreated people there. And there have been, of course, treatment interruptions uh, with HIV treatment and TB treatment because of this internal displacement. That's just precisely the kind of direction we do not want to go in. Uh, so while we are uplifted in some ways, uh, we also are just really cognizant that it's early days. And for the ethnic people of Burma, it's still a really challenging uh, environment. Let me just close by saying uh, we did, uh, I was traveling with the president of Hopkins and a, and a small delegation. Uh, we did uh, have a, an afternoon a meeting before we left the country with Da Aung San Suu Kyi. Um, she is in fantastic form, I must say. And uh, <laughs> she's uh, engaged, uh, absolutely committed to, uh, as she has been for so long, uh, to the health and well-being of her people, very interested uh, in the HIV issues. And I reflected with her uh, that in 2000, uh, which required really a sort of underground insurgent effort, uh, we worked uh, uh, together to get a, a video address for her at the Durban AIDS conference. Um, and in that address, uh, she had basically highlighted two issues, uh, and, and she sort of ran these by uh, before doing it. She said, I really want to say two th principal things. One is that um, everybody uh, deserves compassion. I think we could all agree on that. And then she was very concerned that in Burma at the time, and remember this is 12 years ago, there was this perception that somehow there were 
innocent victims, like you know, babies born to HIV-infected women, and then there were not innocent victims, like people who were injection drug users. And, uh, and she wanted to say, and from a Buddhist perspective, because she is a very devout Buddhist, it is completely irrelevant how anybody gets exposed, right? Everybody deserves compassion. Nobody is outside the circle of our compassion. And to me, that, that is the crux teaching of all the faith traditions. Uh, and it's something that because of the nature of HIV and the nature of so many of the people in the populations who are most heavily affected, um, that is just always a challenge uh, for governments, for communities, uh, and, and really the faith-based organizations and people uh, have led the way in that, in that tolerance. And uh, that is just so critical. So I'm delighted to be a part of this, and, uh, and I'm greatly looking forward to the deliberations and discussions this afternoon. And I uh, want to thank Steve Morrison and CSIS for doing such a spectacular job of helping us at the conference think about these issues. And uh, thank you for your attention. Thank you, Chris and Diane. I'd like to invite our panelists to come forward and get seated along with Diane, uh, and we'll begin the program. There's going to be a, conver for the next 45 minutes to an hour, we'll have a, a structured conversation, and at, at a later point, we will, uh, Diane will open the floor for questions and comments. We have microphones here. When you come forward, please just identify yourself and be, and be brief. Uh, and again, uh, thank you so much for being with us. That's what I was thinking. <laughs> um, well, thanks very much. Can everybody hear me? Is that better? Okay, great. So once again, our uh, steam panelists, we have um, Kay Warren from the, Saddle the Saddleback Church. Ken Hackett from Catholic Relief Services, Anita Hill uh, uh, from the Children Aids Fund, and Kent Hill from World um, Vision. So um, what I'm gonna do is to just start out with um, asking each, each of the panelists just to talk about the contributions of their organization um, to the AIDS response. And I'm also gonna ask you one reason why your organization got involved in the AIDS response. So I think we'll start with Ken. Thank you very much. Um, <laughs> that last question I wasn't uh, expecting, uh, <laughs> but it, it's actually very, very interesting for us. Uh, at Catholic Relief Services, we have operations around the world uh, in 100 countries. And we have a long history of being involved in health, going back to the 60s and 70s when we were doing leprosy programs in Sierra Leone and, and parts of Africa. And um, I took over the organization in 93, and I, in 92 I had returned from the Philippines back to Kenya. This was the time of the Somali crisis. And what I noticed when I returned to Kenya was that friends of mine, people who worked for me, had died in the interim of 10 years when I was either in the Philippines or in the headquarters. And when I asked, they had died of um, TB or pneumonia. Or, eh, this is strange. This is really strange. Um, so I brought to my board, I think it was the first board meeting, the fact that we have to do something about AIDS. And the Catholic bishops, Steve, this was long before your time, said, ooh, touchy issue. And I was advised, do all you can, just don't get us in trouble. This is 92. And so we were doing a lot of community counseling and abstinence behavior change kind of things in Uganda in the early days, in Kenya, Ethiopia, other parts of the world. But we were never doing anything uh, clinical or medical. And there's a, uh, a doctor in, at the University of Maryland, I guess he's a colleague of, of yours, Chris, Dr. Bob Redfield up in Maryland, who came over one day uh, just so that we could meet. This was in 93, 94. And he said, you, you Catholic Relief Services have this capacity of operations in 100 countries. You're connected to the 
the Catholic health systems throughout the world, and you're not doing anything to treat AIDS patients. And he really gave me the, the talking to. And we deliberated uh, for a long time. And we found ourselves more and more engaged. But we're, we had no physicians on board. Um, we had no expertise in, in those early days when the antiretrovirals really weren't doing much and they cost a lot and, and there was no money. Um, but some of us knew it was the right thing to do and when the opportunity presented itself of that PEPFAR, well, first of all, we had to work to get the PEPFAR thing, as, as many people did here, get the legislation through. And then um, we decided to apply and did and won. And then we said, oh my God, we won. <laughs> we won in 11 countries, $365 million. And we don't have a physician on board. So we had to hustle a little bit. But that's the beginning of, of the serendipitous way that we fell into this thing. But uh, I think it was out of the, the, the just right in your face fact that there were so many people that we knew personally who had passed away from the AIDS virus that uh, pulled and pushed us into it all. Great. Well, thanks. How about you, Anita? Well, I'll do the second question first, how, how we uh, <coughs> got involved. Um, Children's AIDS Fund is a faith-inspired organization and has partnered with many faith-based organizations for 20, 25 years ago. Um, Oh, sorry, I'll speak up. 25 years ago, um, we really got involved because of my husband, Shepard, who's already been mentioned here today. Um, we, he was, we had a consulting business at the time, uh, working with faith-based organizations and non, other nonprofits. And he and his father, who was still living at the time, were looking at reports of what was happening. Uh, the beginning of, of the symptomatic, you know, uh, syndrome that, that people were talking about. And, and as we, he and his father talked more and looked at it more, they thought his, his dad was an um, orthopedic surgeon with a public health degree, felt that um, we needed to respond differently and than, than we were at the time. And there needed to be very specific um, steps that were taken and groups that were going to actually limit uh, the spread of what was happening and, and find the answers. Uh, at the time, um, unfortunately, there were some faith-based leaders who were coming out very vocally uh, in opposition to people who, in judgment of people who were uh, affected by this, this new disease, and we knew that was wrong. You know, that was not who we were as people of faith. And so it really was a combination of events. We didn't know anybody. We didn't um, have friends or family that were impacted, but ended up through that series of events, closing down our consulting business and turning it into uh, an AIDS organization um, at that time. And we've been involved for the last 25 years. <laughs> so. So, uh, and one of our first, you asked the question about contributions. Um, the first um, grant, government grant that we got was uh, part of the, the first 11 organizations that were funded by CDC under the America Response to AIDS campaign. And our task was to educate, equip, and engage the faith community in the issue. And so for those first five years, I think we were in a different church, in a different community every weekend, um, going around and, and trying to help educate, because in those days, people knew very little and were very afraid. Mm. So it was important to be there, answer the questions. And, and what was wonderful was in our experience, um, people, once they understood it, they were ready to be involved. They opened their arms, and many, and many times we were invited in if there was a member of the congregation who uh, was infected and before the congregation knew they had issues to handle, and we helped 
work those things through, and in every case but one, <laughs> the congregation embraced the, the infected uh, individual and family. So that was the early contribution to um, the faith involvement, and, and we've been privileged to be a part of the AIDS Relief Consortium for the last eight years under um, Catholic Relief Services that, that uh, Ken was just talking about. So we, we under CAF management, uh, we have about, well, over 50,000 patients on treatment and care. So. Great. Thanks very much. Okay. Hmm. Well, I wish I could say that we were some of the first to respond, but actually we were some of the last to respond. We've come late to the fight, for which I've spent a lot of time apologizing and regretting and wishing that we had not been um, some of those who were early, um, as you spoke, some of the earlier church response, which was not positive. And um, for me, it was it's this 10 years ago, this next month, that um, I had an epiphany, if you will. It was a spiritual experience, reading a magazine article about AIDS in Africa. And at the time, I didn't care. I wish I could say that I did, but I didn't. I didn't know anybody who was positive. It didn't matter to me. It was something that was off my radar. I was busy raising my kids, being a, a pastor's wife. I was very involved in my life, and I was not aware of what was happening in the world, even though the pandemic had been um, decimating lives for so many years at that point. But I picked up that magazine article that day, and something in that moment, it was as if I had never seen anything about HIV before, never understood the scope of it, never understood how many people were infected, never understood how many children were left orphaned and vulnerable. I had, it was as if I just opened it, and it was brand new news that had happened that day. And uh, it launched me into a very deep soul-searching moment. So I spent about a month running as fast as I could from what seemed to be something that I was supposed to be involved in, and yet I felt completely inadequate, <coughs> unprepared. Uh, I had nothing to contribute. I had, I had been a home ec major in college, for Pete's sake. <laughs> what did I know about a medical disease, or what could I do for orphans? It just seemed daunting and um, completely out of my reach. And um, after about a month of just this very deep soul searching and realizing that I had been ignorant, that I had been hard hearted, judgmental, everything I knew was wrong. Top of that, you know, I didn't know much, and when I did know it was wrong. Um, the <laughs> yeah, really sad. Um, just came to a point, that proverbial fork in the road, where you make a conscious decision to choose one way or the other in the way that you think. And I made a conscious decision that I had been wrong, I had been hard-hearted, I had been um, way behind in showing God's love and compassion. And so I just, I said, yes, yes, this is, I know nothing, I will begin to learn. And God put in my path Dr. Robert Redfield. Um, interesting that you would mention him. I think Bob is, is um, he's an, an amazing man. Shepherd and Anita came into our lives. and. Uh, those three individuals began to tutor us and teach us and train us. And um, I began to go to the International AIDS Conferences. And I, I looked at our church and thought, you know what? We have done nothing. We have done nothing for anybody who's HIV positive globally or locally. And that has to change. And so we began the um, HIV AIDS Initiative at Saddleback Church, which has both a local component and a global component. So we care for the people in our community who are positive. We have a support group. Our local HIV pastor is here. I brought him today. Um, I think we may be the only church in the world. I don't think I'm exaggerating. I really think this is true. I think we may be the only church in the world who has four full-time staff members committed to HIV and orphans. That is their only job. We have a local HIV pastor who um, takes care and supports the people in our church and our community who are positive, helps create an atmosphere in our church of acceptance, of safety, of embracing people who are positive. We have a global HIV pastor whose sole responsibility is to care for people globally, teach and train our um, church members to go on short-term and longer-term mission trips to help with a pilot, pro um, pilot project in Rwanda. We have a full-time local um, uh, orphan care director, and we have a full-time global orphan care director. Our full-time orphan care director is here because we are committed to caring for people who are HIV positive. We are committed to doing what we can to call the faith community, to stand up, to not be like we were behind the eight ball, be in the caboose. We want to be the engine that drives the train that says, God cares for people who are HIV positive, 
And this crisis will not be solved without the full commitment and engagement of the faith community. Already, as you'll hear, the faith community and other NGOs has been um, dramatic. But there's a call for local congregations to, to stand up and to say, we care for people who are positive. We care for the orphaned and vulnerable children who are left behind. So that's how we got started. OK. So, sorry. <laughs> no, thanks for your honesty. That was just terrific. Well, Kent, World Vision has just such a huge re reach in health. Tell us about what you're doing and how you got started. Well, a common uh, theme we've heard today is the role of leadership. Um, I was just watching a video this afternoon uh, that somebody had shown me, uh, which was Rich Stearns, who became the president of World Vision back in 1998. And very quickly, he, he came to the conclusion that if you looked at the total reach of World Vision, the amount of money they were spending on HIV AIDS was very, very small. And he took it as a major campaign uh, that the, the scale of the crisis, the, the need to show compassion and to use the, uh, uh, the assets of World Vision internationally and in terms of the US to do something. He, he got on a campaign on that. Didn't have much trouble convincing uh, the international World Vision community to work on this. And as the others have suggested here, there were some people who thought, is this really what we want to be focusing on? But once the uh, message really got uh, heard loud and clear uh, that compassion, Christian compassion, human compassion requires it, then it became a big deal. And back in 2000, uh, it really began to scale up fast for, for World Vision. There was a HOPE initiative uh, that got started. Um, I think uh, in terms of the question of, of what have we done that's probably had the most impact, uh, there was something in the HOPE initiative called Channels of Hope which I looked at the statistics today, I was uh, sort of flabbergasted. I hadn't realized exactly the scale of what was uh, going on. But for example, in Africa, the determination was made that to address questions of stigma, to attract in the network of believers to work in compassionate care and uh, uh, palliative care and testing and all the things you need to do, uh, behavioral change messages, the, the whole uh, range of things, you're gonna need to do real major work with the churches. So we set up these three-day uh, workshops. And the statistics over just a few years are that literally tens of thousands of these workshops occurred uh, with hundreds of thousands of people, and not just Christians. Uh, World Vision ran them for Muslim communities as well. The Muslims were very open to the messages and what we were trying to do. And so uh, World I think that may be the most effective part of what uh, World Vision has done. Now, They've done all the stuff related to, to orphans and behavior change messages and palliative care. And there are very special things that faith-based uh, groups have to offer. And we'll probably talk about that a little later. But I think it's really since, since about 1998, particularly 2000, that this has scaled up as, as a huge initiative for World Vision. Great, thanks. And I, one of the things I just want to say after hearing our panelists uh, uh, share with us that it's really great to see a lot of young people in the audience. You never know when you're going to come across some situation or hear some story or open up some magazine that's really going to move you. And I think you can see what it did to these four people here and really what's happened. So thank you, thank you all for really uh, for sharing that. Um, I'm going to ask questions now to uh, 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 Ken and Kent on the outside of the panel, just about some examples of things your organization has done um, with U.S through U.S. partnerships and non-U.S. partnerships. I know you were track one in, for the PEPFAR program. So tell us a little bit about some of the major accomplishments there, but also about some things you do with non-U.S. partners. Oh, well, the U.S. partners was um, an effort to put together, like Anita's group and, and the University of Maryland and, and others, to find a, a, a combined effort that could bring capacity to other partners in the countries where we work. So taking just the, the Catholic Church's network, uh, let's say in the 11 countries we were in, it's enormous because some of those countries, um, 40 to 70 percent of health care is offered by faith-based organizations and a good chunk of that is Catholic. And we were able to activate that and to support it and to help it grow and help its outreach to many more people. <clears throat> Excuse me. Um, 
I think at this juncture we have approximately 270,000 people on antiretroviral care. Now, a lot of that is going to be passed over to governments under the new plan. We hope that those governments bring the faith-based networks along with them. That's not always the case. Um, but I think what we have been successful in doing is building those capacities locally in those hospitals and health centers at the end of the road. The Seventh-day Adventist, the Methodist, the Catholic uh, Daughters of Charity place, way out there, that have been out there for 50 and 70 years, that have built credibility and legitimacy and trust among the people they're serving. And that has to be sustained for the long term, and, and that's one of the challenges ahead. Okay. Well, with respect to World Vision, um, <coughs> unlike a lot of international organizations in the United States, um, uh, we're not dependent on government grants. We get between two and three hundred million dollars a year, so 75, 80 percent of our money comes from private sources. So most of the money we get to do the work we do uh, comes from other, other sources. And more than half of the money for World Vision International isn't raised by the U.S. at all. Uh, most of the $2.6 billion is raised outside the United States. Now we've gotten global fund grants that World Vision is using in Somalia, for example. Believe it or not, right now in South and Central Somalia uh, through th third party entities. So there is money from uh, non-U.S. government supports, both public and private, but the key, the key partner has been the churches and the religious institutions, the Orthodox Church in Ethiopia, um, Catholics and Protestants in Africa, Muslims, as I mentioned before. They're the, they're the backbone of it because they have the credibility in the community. If you can get them to share the right message and they activate their networks, I mean, they were there before we got there. They're gonna be there once we leave. They're the key is to connect with those community-based organizations. So I think our most important partners are the community-based, uh, faith-based organization partners on the ground. Great. I'm gonna um, uh, ask uh, the, the two ladies on my side just about a, an issue near and dear to your heart, which is women, children, and orphans. So maybe talk a little bit about some of the programs you have with the U.S. government, outside of the U.S. government, working with those populations. Well, it is definitely near and dear to our hearts, and um, we have we have both. Uh, we we have one amazing uh, Catholic hospital partner in rural Malawi uh, that uh, we've been able to work with on private with private funding called Saint Gabriel's. It's in Namatete outside of Lalongwe, and uh, what was wonderful about that partnership. Um, was, you know, they really had an, they had an idea of, they didn't have an HIV program, uh, had an idea of what they wanted to do, and we said, okay, you know, we'll, we'll partner with you and give you the seed money to do it. And, and so, this, <coughs> what's, what's so great about that is because so, so many times donors don't really know what should be done, but we say we'll give you money to do this, and that's not what really has to be done first. So in this case, um, they had a plan for, for a whole year to, to educate their catchment area, which is about 600 villages in very, very rural area. Got the, the head men on board, um, uh, developed village aids committees, and uh, have a whole network of, of people already in place um, educating them about the importance of coming to the hospital, the importance of, of prenatal um, care, uh, importance of learning your HIV status. So after that year uh, of, of uh, activity, they then introduced all of these issues, uh, the testing, you know, treatment, care, and it's the one place, I mean, uh, of all of our partners, I think it's the one place, because they did it right, um, they have kept the uh, HIV numbers down. I mean, there's not a lot of transmission. There is very open discussion, public disclosure in the communities. I mean, these, these commu village AIDS councils have become um, they're trained community health workers, and now they work not just on HIV, but multiple other things. 
And um, you know, it, it's a it, family-centered care is really what we've always advocated as what we need to do to create the right kind of environment. And um, that's what this this is a model of that. And so, with with private funding. Um, and Bob Redfield got us involved in that as well. So. This is, uh, I, if I may, Kay, just one little comment. <clears throat> this particular hospital is, I think, a prime example of what faith-based um, and religious-based and motivated health care offers. Mm -hmm. It's not just the service of right. distributing uh, a vaccine or an antiretroviral. It's a whole wraparound thing. And Anita talked about the community base. The way um, the director of that hospital, with Bob Redfield's help. <laughs> Thank Bob. Thank Bob. <laughs> <laughs> um, pushed uh, and, and encouraged and um, helped that, that unit of good, strong, viable health care expand itself was really terrific. Mm -hmm. And so the wraparound services are having a really powerful impact on adherence, uh, and all kinds of other indicators. Great. So, I mean, we're hearing about the activation energy that the organizations create, about the sense of community and the wraparound services, and Kay? Well, our, yeah, our experience is a little different because we don't receive any government money. We never have. We never received a, a penny of a pet farm money or anything else. Um, not that we shouldn't or others shouldn't, we just, we have chosen not to. We wanted to, um, we felt like that we had a, a place of visibility and we wanted to be able to be completely free from um, um, self-serving motives. We want, didn't want anybody to think that we were advocating for anything because that we were a recipient of money. So we received no pet farm money at, at all. And so our role, I'd say, with orphans is, is twofold um, and very, very dear to our hearts. It was orphans who first captured my attention with HIV, and so they have remained very dear to my heart. But um, two things. We're looking for new ways of doing church-initiated sponsorship, um, a little bit different than other sponsorship programs. We're looking to um, ways that churches can go directly from church to church in different places where the church on the ground actually recommends who the children are. We're looking for ways to keep children within families in um, countries where possible, where traditional sponsorship dollars might be either for a child or for a community. We're looking for ways to strengthen maybe the extended family so that a family could keep a child if they had um, income generation or something else. But we're also advocating adoption for as one of the solutions to the orphan problem. There were only about 9,000 children adopted into the United States last year internationally out of the 16 million that have been um, orphaned by HIV. So if, if AIDS has killed um, and left 16 million children orphaned and only 9,000, let's say, of those were adopted into the United States, um, there's a problem. And we're also advocating the adoption of HIV positive children. This should be a place where the church should shine. We should be the first to say we will take HIV positive children in the country where they are from, but also if that doesn't happen, if there isn't a strong enough support system there, why should a child be left in an orphanage? Children were not made to grow up in institutions. They were made to grow up in families. And there are families available. We just need to make sure that that is done in a really good way. One of the things about orphans that to me is very tragic even at the um, International AIDS Conference is, there is there's not nearly enough emphasis on orphan children or on the HIV positive children. If you look at the numbers of conferences and symposium and events that are about children around orphans, it's minute. And who are the most vulnerable? In HIV, we talk about who are vulnerable populations. Who is more vulnerable than children? No one. No one is more vulnerable. They are the most vulnerable people on our planet. And this should be at the forefront. They should receive the top research dollars. They should receive the top money, the, 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 the best treatment. For, for an adult, we, we would not look at a, a child in America and say, well, if you're, you're sick, let's cut a Tylenol in half and give it to you. We don't do that. Why do we, in HIV care, think that that's appropriate for children? So um, as our role at Saddleback Church, we are, are heavily into advocacy for children, for HIV positive children for sponsorship in, in a little bit different way and for, um, for making sure that people are, are free and uh, understand that they can adopt internationally, these kids who are, are languishing in, in orphanages around the world. 
Well, thanks, Kay, for those comments. I think that um, as we're uh, putting together the conference program, uh, children and orphans will be a focus. There's also another population that needs attention. And as our programs for mother to child transmission become more successful, we have children who, as we say, it's a little bit technical, but are exposed but uninfected. And our scientific studies to date show that these children don't do very well. And we don't know if it's biological reasons, we don't know if it's social reasons, but these children are, in essence, also being left behind. So this is another uh, group that we need all of your advocacy on because these kids are going to be growing up and members of our society and they need our support. So um, Kent, you run a huge organization. I'm sure you have a lot of challenges. Maybe you could share well, with the panel and the audience some of the, within the AIDS response, what have been some of the major challenges for you and your organization? Well, I think actually, uh, I mean, I followed this issue for several years because when I worked for USAID and I worked in the Global Health Bureau um, and actually got a chance to see, um, you know, CRS and Anita and Shepard and other uh, faith-based groups do a good job with, with funding to, to do the work and was part of the very heated debates about the strategy for um, dealing with uh, the prevention of HIV AIDS. And I think I've noticed a change in the last few months that I'm, I'm a bit disturbed by. On uh, December the 1st on International AIDS Day when President Obama spoke and we had a lot of other speakers from all over the world here, I see a sort of backtracking on paying attention to prevention as such. Uh, there's a big push to make this an AIDS-free uh, generation we're, we're wonderfully happy about the empirical evidence that if you're on ARVs, and I think you used the statistic, or you did, 97% of people on ARV are, are not likely to transmit. Wonderful news indeed. Not only do you save lives, but you, you stop transmission. But there is a temptation, I think, to, to try to have just a technical fix uh, to the pandemic of HIV AIDS. And the success that we've known of the last few years has been in large part because there's been behavior change. Mm. And so you take a place like Uganda or Kenya or Zimbabwe, you actually had behavior change. There was a delay of sexual debut. There was greater faithfulness within a marriage and within couples. Uh, there was uh, a lowering of concurrent multiple partners, which everybody knows is the greatest feeder of, this, of, the, uh, of the, uh, the spread of this disease. These were huge factors. Whereas in Southern Africa, the prevalence rates remained and still are stubbornly high they had far more condoms than the rest of Africa, but they didn't change their behavior as much to go along with that. And so if we don't have a combination of prevention um, options and interventions available, we're not going to make this an AIDS-free uh, generation. And here's where I think the faith-based groups uh, need to be very careful that they, they don't lose one of the great gifts they have uh, to deal with this pandemic. And that is to deal with behavior, responsible behavior. Uh, it has to do with sexual debut, and it has to do with faithfulness, and it has to do with Christians in places like South Africa and other places where Christians are technically in the majority, but frankly their behavior does not match what Christian behavior should be in terms of multiple partners. Uh, the church ought to be the first to stand up and say, wait a second, this is the contrary. Your conduct is contrary. Uh, to what we as Christians believe it ought to be. We need to be consistent. If we did that, we would drive down uh, the spread of the disease. So I hope we don't take our eye off the ball in, in continuing to contribute to this part uh, relative to intervention strategies that I think will make a difference. Great, thanks. Yeah. And I, I think we'll be talking about combination prevention a lot at the yeah. meeting, and uh, uh, that will be definitely one of the, the, the featured themes. Um, so Ken, how about you? You alluded to some of them early on when you were starting up. And uh, <laughs> no, I, I think Kent uh, brings up a very, very good point. And I'm, I'm trying to think, you know, we've all seen, those of us who have traveled throughout sub-Saharan Africa, you've seen the billboard with the advertisement about prevention paid for by USAID. I mean, that has an impact? It doesn't have an impact at all. I mean, I don't believe social marketing through billboards is going to change behavior. And uh, I think Ken, Kent raises a very good point that the credibility, the legitimacy of the faith-based health actors can bring about uh, a sense of trust that can bring about change. And when it's pervasive and when there's a collaboration between 
governmental and non-governmental, government and, and faith, uh, health providers, as well as um, for-profit health providers. If, the, if people could get on the same page in a country, I think you could have a powerful, powerful impact on behavioral change and on, on eliminating this disease and other diseases as well. People are not on the same page. I, I, was, I was telling my colleague um, uh, this afternoon at lunch about a story in Kenya that um, when the, the slush of uh, AIDS money came into Kenya uh, from Global Fund and, and from PEPFAR, the government of Kenya, Ministry of Health and its various uh, arms, went out and hired people. Well, where are you going to hire the people from? The trained staff were working in the, the Catholic, the Methodist, the Aga Khan, the other hospitals. And so the faith-based hospitals and health systems were losing their top quality staff. And a group of uh, Christian leaders uh, went and saw President Kabaki and said, this can't happen. I mean, you're, you're devastating our health service. And Kabaki made some adjustments because there was a, a moment of collaboration there. That's not true everywhere, and I think that's something this conference should kind of highlight, where great opportunities for collaboration exist, where together government, non-government, faith-based, and government can make a real change. Thanks. Any, any thoughts on any of those streams of challenges or some examples of cooperation, like we just heard from Kent? Mm. Well, I, I think that um, one of the keys to sustainability that we're all talking about and thinking about as we come, you know, we're coming to the end of the track one funding and, you know, funding is shifting and funding is scarcer and all of those issues that we all know too well. Um, I think that the, the role of the faith-based community is absolutely key to solving that because we've already talked about there are, they're already in the communities they have credibility, they um, know the, the people many times that come, uh, that they serve, um, there is more of a safe place, it helps reduce stigma, all those things um, are important. But, but we just heard a story last week that's kind of, a, the, the, again, a model for sustainability, if you will. Um, there's a group called the Willow Creek uh, Church Association Willow Creek churches in Chicago. They have a network of 13,000 churches, evangelical churches, and they've been working in um, several sub-Saharan African countries. But the story last week was there was a USAID-funded project in this very remote set, um, northern part of Malawi uh, that ended, and, and we've all been through that as well. The project ends. It's not recompeted. What's going to happen? You know, <laughs> what, what now? But the great part about this story is the churches that the Willow Creek Association has been working with and training in that area are actually going to be able to pick up what was, what was being done. They won't lose momentum. The program will continue, and it will be done locally without U.S. government funding. So, I mean, to me, that's, we can look at obstacles, and there are many. <laughs> But if we continue to look at the models that work and strive for that, uh, and working together as, as uh, Ken is talking about, it has to be a, a collaborative effort uh, where everyone does their part and makes that come together. Can I key off something, Please. what Anita said? Um, as I told you, we don't take any government funds. And so um, one, of the, one of the crying needs um, is for healthcare workers. I mean, everybody bemoans the fact that there are not health, not, not community health care workers because there will never be enough doctors, you know, nurses. There just will never be enough professionals. And so how can we have community health care workers to take up some of the slack? So in western Rwanda, in, um, in the Kabuye region of western Rwanda, two years ago we began a pilot project where we went to 14 churches in the area and one mosque. And they, they said, and we asked, would you recommend two people from your church or your mosque to come and receive community health care training? And so, you know, within a short space of time, there were 27 health care workers that, that we had trained. No government money, no outside money. This is a local church doing this in western Rwanda um, in collaboration with the local churches. Well, now, two and a half years later, there are 3,500 
um, community health care workers trained in that area. And by the fall of this year, there will be 7,000 um, community health care workers trained without a penny of, of government money or anybody else's money. It has been something that the churches have done. They have come back and forth. The local, the indigenous church has um, received training. And each of those healthcare workers has a caseload of seven families. And so in a year, they will make 49,000 home healthcare visits. Um, they teach a spiritual lesson. They teach a hygiene lesson. And um, so we're keeping the metrics on it because we really believe that it will, over time, raise the level of healthcare in that entire area. It's scalable, it's reproducible. It is something that you can do without a lot of money. And in, in an era where the economic downturn is getting worse, there's no good news economically. There just isn't, and there won't be for a long time. And with government, our government and others cutting funds, there has to be some way to step in the gap um, and fill some of those gaps where there have been government funds in the, in the past that have taken care of things but there has to be something that is more sustainable. It has been said by each of us, the church is there in every community. It's an existing distribution channel for both information, for care, for support, for treatment, for, for treatment adherence, for the adherence coaches that could raise the level of, of people staying on their medication. The church in a community, I mean, we talk a good talk of honoring the faith-based community, but I haven't seen it really yet. And I'm so anxious to see if these are not just words, but really something that will be put into practice to value what the faith community brings, the local credibility, the fact that we will be there long after a grant expires, long after a government change. Even if there's conflict, if there's turmoil, if there's disaster, the church is going to remain in a community. So the credibility, the durability of it, the fact that it's an existing distribution channel, the, the faith community offers the highest motivation of all, and it is love. The faith community brings to this fight something that is not going to get tired. It's not going to get worn out. It's not because it's great foreign policy to have countries like us because we help them out in their problems. This is going to the heart and the core of who we are as human beings. And the faith community brings that love and that compassion that will not grow weary in doing good. And so to see the faith community given not just a seat at the table or a cursory glance, but to understand that, that we bring distinctives that can really turn this epidemic around is heartening to me and exciting. I'm, ex I'm thrilled to see the interest in that, and I really hope that it, it becomes more than lip service, but that the faith community has a role that's Don, vital. Could I, could I give you some examples that are non-Christian to make the same point? The key is to find whatever the religious community is in a given area and then tap into that. And we heard an example earlier of, of Buddhists. Let me give you one that's Muslim in India. It's not about HIV AIDS, it's about polio. Uh, the state or the province is Uttar Pradesh. Having a difficult time getting uh, the folks to get their inoculation rates up. It was 20%. They decided to go to the Muslim community because there was a lack of trust in the product. And they convinced the Muslim leaders to do this. They got behind the effort and they went from 20% to 85% polio coverage. Now that's just another example of you take the community, it happens to be Muslim in this case, but it could be Buddhist, it could be, it could be any variety of Christian community, but they have the trust. If they give the right messages, they're the best positioned to make the change. So um, this, is a, this is tr has tremendous public health potential uh, to activate these communities and bring out the best. And the other thing I'd like to say is, I think it sends a very powerful message when diverse religious communities cooperate together around a common um, problem. Because it sends a message of religious freedom and religious tolerance to the broader community. Uh, because we all know religion isn't always a positive factor. It wasn't always a positive factor in the early stages of combating HIV AIDS. Uh, it's, and it's a big group. You've got people who, who embarrass you, who are part of your religious group. <laughs> so the, the point is to get people of goodwill who really are faithful to their religious traditions, have them work together, and you bring out the best in those traditions. Great. Would does one of the panelists want to pick up on the, the cooperation, interfaith cooperation, examples that they have? Well, just to Kent's point, uh, this area of cooperation and collaboration among faith groups 
has been longstanding. I mean, there are these entities throughout the world, Christian Health Association of Ghana, of Malawi, of, and then those associations will collaborate with other faith groups, Muslim, Indian, Aga Khan, whatever. So that, that is a long-standing issue that I think is under-recognized by the international um, public health community. Um, whether it be for HIV AIDS or for malaria or for TB or, or what. And I think that can be maximized if it's, if the, um, those individuals in governments, in the global fund, uh, the people who are putting the money behind things can help the Ministry of Health see that that's not a threat. That's a collaborative partner. If you can work with this grouping of Christian Muslim agencies. Uh, but that's not the message they're getting. Oftentimes they're getting build the size of your ministry, make it more efficient uh, and more effective, not build up the whole health service. Great. Um, I want to just uh, uh, draw out, uh, Kay, something that you said that is a, is a theme that we are going to be also wanting to highlight in the conference. Um, and that is the, the training of community health workers, not just for HIV, but for multiple diseases. Mm -hmm. And I think that there's a, a, a very unproductive debate about AIDS exceptionalism. And I think we really need to put that debate aside and to talk about the ways that as we do, I guess the appropriate terminology is task sharing, no, not task shifting, among our community health workers really to raise the level of the whole health of the community. And I think that that's a very exciting concept that we will be uh, featuring in the, uh, the AIDS epidemic. I think now we can um, open up the, uh, the, the panel to um, some audience questions. Um, the way that we'll do this, if you could kindly identify yourself, we'll take a couple of questions and maybe take two or three and then we'll uh, uh, serve them to the panelists. I'm very taken with how all of the panelists have highlighted, oh, by the way, I'm Stephen Kolecki, I'm with the U.S. Conference of Catholic Bishops. I'm very taken by how the whole panel highlighted the distinctive contributions that the religious community uh, can make and the strengths that we can build upon and the reach that we can have in local communities and so forth and the spiritual resources we can bring to the task. Um, one other thing that is important for those communities that do collaborate with government is the ability to do an active partnership. And one of the things that was important in the PEPFAR, original mm -hmm. PEPFAR legislation and then in the reauthorization was that there would be an emphasis on abstinence and behavior change, which mm -hmm. you alluded to uh, earlier, but also that there would be conscience clauses so that faith communities could, could do what they do well and make that contribution, but not have to do those things with which they don't have any expertise right. or have a moral uh, problem or objection. And I was just wondering if the panel could uh, comment on uh, how the faith community can work with our own government as it moves toward reauthorization of PEPFAR in the future. Even if the dollars are less, it's still a significant player and having active partnerships will be important. So preserving those conscience clauses and other uh, uh, dimensions of that will be important. Thank you. Great, thanks. Yes, in the back. Ladies and gentlemen, my name is Rosemary Seguero. I'm the president of Seque Hope for Tomorrow, an organization that focuses on young people and women. I'm initially from Kenya. Hello. I want to thank you all so much for this wonderful. Uh, presentation on faith based. Uh, thank you for so many. All over the world talking about We have had so many uh, conferences all over the world since the epidemic broke in Africa. So many people have died, women, children who are victims. And I, th I want to thank Faith Based because Faith Based has really supported Africa when it comes. I don't know how many countries, but Africa has 50, over 50 countries. And Faith Based has really supported Africa, especially with vulnerable children and orphans of HIV AIDS. How do you look or what do you think is very, very important? Is it prevention, protection, or treatment to those that are victims 
and are you collaborating with African faith organizations and faith and organizations like mine how can we collaborate because hiv has been there if we collaborate with you faith based i think uh, there would have been very very big change especially people on the ground and you from here so how can we collaborate with us and those back in africa as i say africa has 51 countries maybe you've been i don't know but uh, i think faith based has, is doing good work and has been doing good work thank you One more question. Yeah, I'm Heather from the Guttmacher Institute. And I also had a question about the conscience, conscience provision. So I wanted to jump on that question. And just talk, I would like you to talk. You've talked convincingly, I think, about the love and compassion that's really at the center of your work. And I wanted to hear a little bit about the um, protections of beneficiaries of your programs. Um, I'm thinking particularly of discordant couples who who need information about the importance of condom use in their lives. And if there are objections to condom use, then just how to meet those special needs of those discordant couples. Thank you. I think what we'll do is that, uh, we'll take these three questions, and then I'll have you come back first um, to the microphone, because I think we have quite a bit of material for the panel. Yeah, let me, let me begin with the, uh, the conscience uh, clause. I, I think, um, one of the big factors in why the international effort on HIV AIDS has been successful has been a big tent approach. And in a big tent approach, you have a lot of people under the tent who have something to contribute, but they don't contribute everything and they don't even necessarily like each other. <laughs> I mean, let's be honest. Um, when, uh, when the US G would give money, USAID would give money to faith-based groups, it would give money to very secular groups who didn't like the faith-based groups, who didn't like any talk about abstinence or be faithful, didn't want to talk about uh, behavior change at all, who didn't, uh, didn't like us distributing uh, more condoms than anybody else in the world. Uh, and the other side of the spectrum didn't like us talking about abstinence and being faithful. And the conclusion we came to was you really needed all of these different approaches. You didn't need to require that everybody commit to or believe in all of them. What you did need was for them to do what they were capable of doing that would make a difference. And there has been a, a, a very definite shrinkage of the conscience clause understandings in the United States in the last few months. And whether it's the Catholics being told that if you don't do what we think is the right thing to do with respect to offering or requiring of your employees or, or providing for your employees contraceptives when that would violate a, a tenet of your faith uh, to saying uh, that you may not participate if you don't have the right views on a particular sexual issue. These are very dangerous moves that will have very severe religious freedom consequences and public health consequences. If we were to do something that did not continue to include the faith-based uh, players in the fight against HIV AIDS because some don't agree with everything that the faith-based groups believe, we lose tremendous amount of firepower. On the other hand, if you just went for faith-based partners and you didn't have secular partners and you didn't have people who worked with uh, folks who, let me, let's, let's talk real frankly here. If you, if you didn't realize that prostitutes who are willing to play a major role in making sure that condoms are used, if you, because you didn't like what prostitutes do, which many religious groups, all religious groups that I know of, don't really favor, they don't think it's healthy for women, they, they don't think it's good for the community. Nevertheless, it's better to use a condom in a prostitute situation and not infect family members, innocent family members or children. I think you've got to have a big tent that allows people to play the role they are willing and able to play to do that. That's going to keep involved the faith-based groups. It's going to keep involved others who don't always agree with everything in the faith-based groups. But we've got to do what we can to protect the conscience of all who are involved to allow us to gain the full um, benefit of what they have to offer. And we need to, we need to fight hard for... Uh, the conscience provisions to be there that will allow that full range of, uh, of actors to play a role. Any of the other uh, panelists? Like Eloquently said, mm -hmm. Kent, and I don't have to answer Steve's question, which makes it 
<laughs> even better. And I, and I think it, it partially answers the question from the woman from their gut marler. Um, I'd, I'd partially. Ask, yeah. And one of the things I wanted to say in response to your question uh, related to condoms, discordant couples, et cetera, I think that, that often there's an assumption made about faith-based uh, organizations and what they do. There's a broad range of, of services that are provided. In some instances, they don't distribute condoms. In others, we do. And so it's a matter of understanding. Uh, and if there's something that, that our partners can't provide, we, we do referrals. So it's, the elements are there. Um, and, and so I think that that's also important in terms of what Kent was saying. Big tent, we all work together. We, we do our, we contribute our strengths and work with others who, who do things well that we don't do or don't do well. So I think in, in that way, that's how we've addressed that issue. Great, thanks. Um, our second question that we had was just, I would generically reframe it as um, how your organizations are working um, side by side, hand in hand with um, African faith-based organizations. Bernie, member of the panel. Well, let me start. Um, if you visit our office in Westlands, we'll talk to you in Westlands. We, we work with hundreds of organizations in Kenya, <laughs> in every part of Kenya, and as does World Vision and many other organizations. So we're open to collaboration. We don't know everyone who's doing everything. But we're open to uh, support, find out, collaborate with all types of African religious or faith organizations. And I, I think that probably speaks for just about everybody. Thank you very much. Uh, I want to thank CSIS for this forum and to some of my dear friends, and uh, you all have been great. I'm really here to make an announcement. I am, um, <laughs> I am Pranessa Seal, the CEO of The Bomb in Gilead, and for 23 years, we've been mobilizing the faith community to address HIV and working in five African countries, bringing Christians and Muslims together, building their capacity to take on this work. We are also PEPFAR funded, but I'm standing here to take this opportunity because for many years, uh, that comes along with the uh, International AIDS Conference are so many pre-conferences. And one of those pre-conferences is the Interfaith uh, Conference. And this year, uh, July 19th through the 20th, uh, the pre the global interfaith conference will be held at Howard University. Our theme is taking action for health, dignity, and justice. As many of you know, the international sponsor is the Ecumenical Advocacy Alliance out of Geneva, and the national co-sponsors is the Bomb in Gilead, the Catholic Medical Mission Board, and the American Jewish World Service. You can visit, the website is up. Our call for abstracts have not yet come out, but the, the, uh, the website is iac-faith.net. We have a call for chaplains at this time, and I just want to invite you all to stay tuned because I know that most of you in this room are a part of that global interfaith conference, and we want to see all of you, all of your participation this year in the United States at Howard University here in DC. Thank you. Thank you. I, I'm going to take the moment to just ask some of the panelists. I know Kay had shared some really exciting things that her group was planning on doing up to the conference. Maybe, maybe you could uh, all share with us. Sure. Um, we're looking, I was just talking with um, some of the folks um, from CSIS that, that we are looking to mobilize 100 churches. We had started with 10 and decided that wasn't nearly enough. Um, 100 churches in Washington, D.C. to um, not just be a presence during the conference. We would like to do two things. We would like to mobilize churches in the D.C., Baltimore, Northern Virginia area to maybe fly the red ribbon during this conference week. A um, lot of churches show that sign of support on World AIDS Day, but what an incredible moment for the faith community and synagogues, mosques, whoever would like to fly the red ribbon. Red? That's what it sounded like. <laughs> Elmer Fudd, the wed ribbon, the red ribbon <laughs> during, um, during that week. 
we in particular, um, are, we have one that has a cross in the middle of it because we believe that it gives two messages. One, that God cares for people who are positive and that we can't solve the crisis without the faith community, without the church. So that'd be one thing that we would like to mobilize churches, but we'd also like to not only have them make that statement during the week, but an ongoing um, outreach ministry. So if 100 churches would decide that they would begin an HIV ministry outreach in this area um, as a result of that conference, and we're looking for 50 of those 100 to be in the African American community. It's got to be, um, it's got to be a partnership between um, African American churches and everyone. So we are looking to do that. We're looking to take people to the conference from our church. We're hoping to bring about 40 people from our church, mobilizing other evangelical pastors in the United States to come. It's a perfect opportunity here. It's, it's in our capital, and Washington being the AIDS capital of the United States, it would be tragic, if not almost hypocritical, to not address the epidemic here um, locally um, while we're bringing in people from all around the world. This is it's a moment. It's a moment. Well, thank you, Kay, and stay tuned for that. Um, yes. Hi, my name is Jennifer Chow. I'm with Research America. Um, I know we've talked a lot about um, delivery, um, and we know that um, you know the faith-based community we've talked is a very powerful force, both here and abroad. I was wondering if you guys could comment a little bit about that force here in the U.S. and um, the role for advocacy, um, specifically around research and development um, here in the U.S., using your reputation, using uh, your roots in the community. Um, and how we can uh, gather more support from key leaders around that, um, perhaps even at the conference. Hi, my name is uh, Father Kiro. Uh, I actually just started an, uh, my own non-for-profit organization called the Blessed Mother Teresa Center for Hope, uh, providing support for the LGBT community, uh, for those who have been rejected by friends, family, and uh, others because of their HIV status. Um, so, but my question is, we've hear, we hear a lot about what's the work happening in Africa, which I ha uh, I've had the opportunity to see firsthand, uh, as well as in other places in the wor world, but when it comes to North Africa and the Middle East, we barely hear anything, and there's a big crisis over there. So I wanted to know kind of what is happening and what's being done over there, uh, other than Lebanon, because I know Lebanon is pretty advanced in regards to that. But when we're talking about Egypt, Iran, um, you know, Israel itself, Palestine, and so on, there's there's a big crisis in those countries, and but we'd never hear what's going on, what kind of work is being done there. So it'd be nice to hear more about it. Great, thank, thank you. you. Great question. One more. Hi, my name is Ashley Weatherford. I'm here representing the Best Shot Foundation. I actually, I wanted to to piggyback off of her question um, about galvanizing members of the faith-based community um, in order for advocacy purposes. But I also wanted to know sort of what you think it takes to, to encourage members of the faith community to support funding that is very essential to programs like PEPFAR or the Global Fund. Thank you. Great. Good question. So maybe we'll start with the Middle East question. Right? Our panelists like to tackle that one. Yeah, let me just, uh, I took it, you were talking about uh, the discrimination, even violence against LGBT folks in the Middle East and in Northern Africa? Uh, that and also people are in Northern Yeah. I suppose on the latter point, um, it hasn't got as much attention because relative to Africa, the prevalence rates weren't as alarming. But on the, the first issue about the violence and the discrimination, the, the hostility, the, and, and, and really um, pretty bad situations relative to violence, you're absolutely right. Uh, those situations, no, no compassionate Christian, no compassionate person of any religious faith could in any way condone and not to be a part of uh, stopping any kind of violence against groups. The issue is not what you think about their sexual behavior. Uh, this is totally immaterial uh, to when people are abused and violence against them. So, but you're right, that's a serious problem there and, and to the extent we can have some impact on saying, you know, separate whatever your views are on sexuality uh, from um, um, condoning or not attacking any activities that are, are uh, hostile to this group or anybody else that is subject to that kind of persecution. 
So I would just say you raise a, a very valid point. It, it is uh, very much under the radar in North Africa and the Middle East. Uh, in Lebanon, I was all set to say something about Lebanon, and you cut me off there. But uh, <laughs> no, you, you're right. But there are so many other issues that have been heaped on the on the stage in in North Africa and the Middle East that that one is just getting very little attention um, from most of our the operating agencies. But the funding issue I think is important too because nobody's mentioned it yet but I think really uh, a key role that the, the faith-based communities played during the budget debates over the last six months they played an absolutely critical role in keeping the health numbers uh, relatively steady. Uh, I have a vice president who just deals with advocacy in a team of 12 people and he conducted, I read his evaluation of his team over the weekend, uh, hundreds of, of meetings with uh, senators and congressmen, all making the case that the faith-based community cares what the levels are. They don't want disproportionate cuts in the budget. They don't want it done on the, the backs of the poor around the world or in this country. What better group than the faith-based community to say, look, these are difficult times financially, but this is not the place to be making the cuts. And I think with some impact. And we weren't the only group that did that. Um, so I think the, the role of faith-based groups in, in helping the government to keep their numbers up for the budgets is very important. Even as they raise money privately to do this good work, the government has an obligation to do something and this ought not to be where the cuts take place. But the reality in terms of increased money for research into this area or, or service, under, under this budget environment, it's basically hold rather than increase. And I think Sorry. together we've done a lot of things on, on Capitol Hill, but it is a real hard push at this point in time to get big increases. And one other point I just wanted to pick up in regard to the Middle East, one of the features of the National AIDS Conference is we have regional sessions. So we are going to have a specific regional session about that part of the world and we will have experts and panelists and members of the community really try to delve into the problem that you really just uh, you brought up. So thank you very much, really uh, excellent. Um, other questions, yes. Thank you very much for this very important and very vital point about uh, how to work together as, uh, as different religious groups and towards our common enemies like HIV, tuberculosis, and others. And also I'm proud of like how the Catholic Relief Agency they work in different African countries. But now I'm very interested to hear like what is like the next step towards other relig uh, in contacting other religious leaders in this country because as a Muslim now I'm hearing the word like HIV and uh, like homosexuality pop, pops up in the Muslim sermons. So I think it's uh, kind of, they are entering into it. So what is, uh, it's, it's good to collaborate and fight against the enemy. And I would be interested to get all of you like uh, business cards and go after mosque after mosque, you know, to deliver this message, you know. The other thing also, it, I'm very much curious to hear that like whenever we talked about global, we take U.S. out of the, question, the equation. Mm -hmm. So what is like uh, being like Washington, D.C., the most prevalence rate even compared to Uganda? Mm -hmm. Like uh, what is the activities here in this uh, community? I haven't heard anything about what's going on in our neighborhood, Ward 7, Ward 8 areas. Mm -hmm. Thank you very much. Hi, um, I'm Christina Herman. I work with the Missionary Oblates of Mary Immaculate, and um, it's a Catholic order. It's in 65 countries, and we have AIDS clinics on the ground in Africa. But um, our what we focus on primarily is um, talking to companies. So we talk to all the major pharmaceutical companies. We do this in collaboration with other faith-based shareholders in the Interface Center on Corporate Responsibility, um, which is a 40-year-old organization in New York. So I just wanted to throw that into the mix as sort of an additional, you know, a different take on how to deal with the AIDS uh, problem. Um, I think the, the global health work within ICCR started with um, 
faith-based shareholders going to, to pharmaceutical companies and saying, you know, basically asking for drug donations. This was back in the 90s. And then it's evolved to talking about, now we're talking about the business model and pricing. And specifically, and this is my question, relates to the pricing issue of second and third line drugs, and particularly in middle income countries, where the companies see uh, those, you know, people, at least people with resources in middle income countries as the next big market. So, you know, as you folks are, are really on the ground um, providing services, how, how do you see that as, uh, as a problem? Or do you see it as a problem? And did, do you have any views on the um, Unitaid patent pool? That's something we've been talking to companies a lot about as a way to try to, um, you know, pull the intellectual property of the HIV AIDS drugs and create new formulations, focus more on pediatric formulations, that sort of thing. So, mm -hmm. thank you. Yeah, hi, David Bryden with results. Uh, thanks for the interesting panel. Just a real quick question about um, uh, tuberculosis and HIV AIDS. As we know, tuberculosis is the single biggest killer of people living with HIV AIDS. And so I'm interested to hear how your programs have been addressing uh, TB, HIV co-infection, for instance, are your, are, are churches that you're working with working to break down stigma about TB, which is actually very high, uh, and, uh, and to help, to help people in the congregation know the signs and symptoms, uh, and be willing to come forward, uh, for screening, um, and I, and I guess with the, um, with the conference itself, maybe you could, uh, tell us a little bit about how TB, HIV will be, uh, how you expect it will be addressed. Um, uh, within the uh, program of the conference, and I don't know if there's if there's space to comment, but I'd be curious to know, as you look at uh, as you look at HIV AIDS, and obviously um, I, my question is about TB. But if you look at TB, it's killing almost as many people as HIV AIDS on a yearly basis. Uh, it's very close, actually, in terms of overall numbers. And I'm wondering if you have any thoughts about how. Um, how uh, the faith community might take up that as an issue, whether it's HIV related or not. Obviously, the faith community has embraced the other causes, particularly malaria, uh, but um, hasn't picked up as much on TB as an advocacy uh, issue per se, even though, as we were hearing, the, the research and agenda, research and development agenda is very important on TB uh, and, and getting overall funding, obviously, is important. Thank you. Great, thanks, David. I think we'll start with that question. Just ask any of the panelists if they want to comment on their work in HIV and TB and their advocacy efforts. Just from um, our point of view, uh, we have not been focusing specifically on TB, but the partners that we support, the mission hospitals at the end of the road, have long been dealing with the issue of, of TB as well as AIDS and as well as malaria. They're full service providers for all diseases in in the catchment area that they are serving. So if, I mean, we're not focusing a, a, a particular advocacy agenda on TV, although that should be considered, um, but in terms of dealing with TB as a disease, it is being addressed through all of these Christian and, and other types of faith-based hospitals. That's our experience as well. All of our partners are addressing both and um, screening for both uh, and malaria as well. So, so it's all part of the package that's being, um, the services that are being provided. Um, and we should think about what more we could do to help, help the issues that you're talking about. I, and we will we'll do that, actually. Great. And just to answer um, David's question in terms of the conference there, one of the plenary talks has been dedicated to HIV and TB, which is going to be delivered by Professor Tony uh, Harris, who lived in Malawi for decades, actually, uh, and worked in both HIV and TB, um, as well as some symposium uh, 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 sessions, and as well as some skills building sessions. And I really, just um, hearing the, the question, I really would invite the faith-based community um, HIV and TB is an area that I work in, and I think we can all get better at the way we deliver care. And I think the faith-based community and some of those skill building sessions would be wonderful to have you at the table in those discussions, so really we can all brainstorm together about how to do it a little bit better. Because it's still a little bit siloed, and I think we could uh, probably make some progress. Um, there was a question in the audience about what's happening here. Um, 
uh, in the United States and in Washington, D.C. I know there's tremendous amounts of groups here in the city from the faith-based community who are, gonna be, who are working actively in HIV are going to be at the conference. Would any of the panelists would like to comment on that? Well, I think you, Kay, brought this up well before, and I was really pleased to hear I hadn't heard that before. But it is true that the HIV rate is higher here than I think any place else in the country. So it's great that you're planning on doing that. I would like to say something about the drug question, if I Absolutely, could, yes. about how to um, address the uh, drug companies and the problem with patents, et cetera. Of course, the issue is a very complicated one in the sense that you don't want to do anything that interferes with the research to get done, which will make the breakthroughs. At the same time, there's plenty of room to appeal to drug companies on their pricing and uh, what can be a, a, a win, win situation. Uh, which brings up this issue that I, I really want to say as well. There's a tendency sometimes to talk about faith-based organizations in terms of their moral fiber and their character, et cetera, et cetera. But I think it's terribly important not to draw some kind of sharp artificial distinction between the faith-based uh, communities and their moral commitment and the rest of the, the, the international humanitarian world. Uh, we all know that there are plenty of people who are not in quote-unquote faith-based organizations who are motivated by the very highest uh, standards of conscience and, and, and belief in morality, et cetera. And there's plenty of room for collaboration for people of goodwill, whether they're in organizations that call themselves faith-based or not faith-based. And there's actually a theological warrant for this uh, with respect to Christianity in particular, which requires us to see in all human beings, whether they happen to call themselves religious or not, as repositories of the design spark of uh, conscience, if nothing else, even if that's all you call it. Uh, any place you see works being done that are good, uh, it's theologically sound to say God is in some way at work there. And uh, it's, it's a really an important message for Christians and other religious believers never to forget uh, that there are people of goodwill out there that are more than willing to cooperate and are motivated by extremely high values. And we need all the help we can get and uh, we should, we can go together to those drug companies sometimes and say, is there a way we can, you can meet your needs and yet you can help us get a good price. I used to be on the Gavi board and this was the big issue is, is there a way, the, the Global Alliance for Vaccines and Inoculations, and we talked a lot about how do you go and make an, an appeal uh, to maybe you buy in advance a lot of drugs. So you, the international community agrees to buy a lot of drugs and they agree to put the price down a lot. Well, there are ways to talk about this in a way that they won't, they'll have something to report to their stockholders and we can get what we need, which is a product that uh, we can reach the poor with. I'm looking at one of the online questions, which I think you answered in some kind of a way, which was, how in such a divided country can we move this issue forward in a positive way? Mm -hmm. I think you partially respond to that. And I, I would just turn that question around. If any country can move forward in a positive way, we have total religious freedom here. We are just, for those of you who travel around the world and you just see how other countries don't have this, how fortunate we really are. And to have the, the good ideas and the goodwill um, uh, and the good faith of the, the, the panelists here at the table, I think we can be very optimistic mm -hmm. in that regard. That's not our biggest enemy. Could, uh, I, could I address the question about collaboration with Islamic groups? Um, I think the, the area of interfaith collaboration on health programs is rich. People might, you know, the Boko Haram may be killing Christians in northern Nigeria, but there are some efforts um, in Nigeria right now that show real and true interfaith collaboration around medical things. And that can be repeated and seen in Uganda and in and many other places. So there's opportunities there, and I think there's a willingness. Now, there are issues, but I think in the health arena, you can get beyond those issues. Good afternoon. Thank you for an excellent panel and greetings to my friends on the panel. Um, the International AIDS Summit, uh, as you said in your introductory remarks, uh, sets the standard for evidence um, in, this, uh, in this area. And I would like to ask the panel to comment on the challenges that uh, many of us working with faith-based organizations mm -hmm. 
face in representing um, and, and presenting um, to donors, to governments, to partners, um, to secular organizations, uh, the evidence uh, for the fine work that mm -hmm. has been described in so many wonderful instances here uh, by our panelists. Um, it's really exciting to hear about the evolving vision for scale up, for multi-faith collaboration, for partnering with governments. But in the end of the day, and I, I think Kent of Gavi, for example, mm -hmm. uh, $4.3 billion, who's the best distribution system in the world? Mm -hmm. Where's the evidence? So mm -hmm. I put to the panel the question of how the summit might be used most productively and constructively to invite from our community the very best of the development of thinking when it comes to presenting, collecting, and presenting the evidence. Thanks. Hello. Um, thank you to the panelists and for all of the work you do. I have a comment more so and an invitation more so than a question. My name is Amanago Ufamada and I'm with the AIDS Healthcare Foundation. We're one of the largest providers of care in, in the United States and um, also have programs in 26 countries. And on the first day of the International AIDS Conference, we're hosting a march and rally here in Washington, D.C. to call attention to the need for world leaders and governments to continue to fund HIV treatment. We're encouraged not only by the evidence we find in our programs, but also by the science that shows with um, an increase in treatment and getting more people on treatment, we can not only prolong the lives of people living with HIV, but we can also reduce the transmission of this disease. It's encouraging. Um, it gives us hope that this can actually be eradicated in our lifetimes. And it's an issue that unites all of us, Christians, Muslims, black, white. It's uh, something that we all know that everyone deserves. And so we invite you to join us. It's going to be July 22nd here in Washington, D.C. And you can go to our website, keepthepromise2012.org, to sign up your support. And I hope to see you all there in July. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Thank you. My name is Lynn Alward from the World Faiths Development Dialogue at Georgetown University. And um, Mrs. Warren, you referred um, in passing to the fact that faith-based organizations don't necessarily get the respect or the place at the table, despite the international community saying how much they're valued. And um, I do hear that, you know, we hear that a lot, that faith-based organizations are, to some extent, underfunded, overlooked, off the radar. I'd like to ask, what would it look like if faith-based organizations had a better place at the table? Is this a matter of coordination among faith-based organizations? And is there a problem with faith-based organizations tending perhaps to be somewhat more fragmented or very numerous? For example, the perspective of Saddleback Church, which doesn't take any government funding, gives you, you know, perhaps a, a different um, perspective than Catholic Relief Services, which has been very successful and active, say, in working with US government funding. Thank you. Oh, that's a great question. You're going to ask all the panelists yeah. to answer that one. <laughs> Who wants to start? <laughs> well, yeah, she addressed it to me. So would you just make sure that, that people, just as you're leaving, just, you know, everybody's making an announcement, so I'm going to make an announcement, okay? So we printed up just a, a flyer that's two-sided that just kind of some of the basic um, tenets of what we believe every church can do about HIV, the advantages and benefits of the um, faith community in global health, and this little diagram right here on the, this little colored section right here is uh, an example of a place in, in Rwanda that I mentioned to you where there are three hospitals, um, 18 clinics, but 725 churches. Just to make the visual of where would you like to get your health care? One of these three hospitals spread out, one to two days walk, a clinic, maybe one day walk, or a church that is in every little hamlet in that area. So grab one of those on your way out. The question, um, that you had asked about the faith community. Some of that, I'm going to actually defer to these folks who um, receive government help all the time. But at the, the very heart of it, I would say that there is a prejudice against the faith community that, that I have experienced in funding, in um, on the ground. You, you, there may even be a policy at the government level of, of acceptance of the faith community and their contribution. But then you get at country level, or you get um, the and it's not always the same story. And so I would just say there is um, an attitude toward the faith community that they aren't valued as highly probably as they should be. And then some of the messages don't get transmitted down the pipeline to the people on the ground that the faith community should be honored and respected. And I think when it comes to funding, um, 
I think faith community is at a disadvantage many times in not given um, some of the doors are closed to the to the faith community or the restrictions are in place and um, really these others can speak to that more thoroughly than I can since we don't take it but this is what I know from speaking to many folks like these good folks here um, let me see if I can give a perspective on the attitudes so you're working with CDC, uh, you're posted in Uganda, or you're with AID, you're posted in Uganda. Who do you deal with? You deal with the Ministry of Health. And you deal with them in the morning and in the evening. And you get to know them very well. You're not dealing with the Sisters of Divine Mercy who are up north of Gulu. Uh, the ones who have the rubber-soled sandals. They don't come in with the suits. And I think there's a, that's part of it. It's a little bit of ignorance uh, on the part of the public health professionals who were trained in the best universities, who get assigned to the capital city, are told to deal with the Ministry of Health, not to deal with the Oblates or the Cambonis. So that's something that has to be factored in. And I, and I think it's coming. It's, uh, but it, it, it has to be built around evidence. So somebody mentioned in one of the questions, what are you going to bring in terms of evidence that the faith-based community can actually produce at a scale as effective a service as anybody else? And I think that's some of the abstracts that should be brought forward for this conference. I mean, my, my people gave me notes about an 88% viral load suppression level. I don't know whether that's good or bad. But it's, it's a good. number. It's, good. It's, good. It's, good. it's a number. So that's really good. You know, but we don't want to say too much about that because we can't get it published in the journal of this or that. Um, but that's the numbers we have, and and I think if we can bring that kind of evidence-based approaches to the table, you can't. If you're the CDC, the the Global Fund, or the USAID health person, you can't ignore it. And certainly, let's say we, we welcome that. The abstracts are due in two weeks, so please uh, <laughs> submit your abstracts. I just wanted to say I do think that um, the transition of the PEPFAR funding from U.S. to the country level is actually helping this because um, you have local partners who are stepping up and in many cases faith-based entities. Um, that are taking on more and more responsibility. So they will be at the table more than the international partners uh, who have been there. So I think that that's a step th in the right direction uh, in terms of being at the table and how, how we make that happen. Um, and in terms of the evidence qu question, I just wanted to say part of what you know, we've been advocating for a long time is mapping mapping, mapping all of the services that are out there because it, it looked one way, you know, in, in the PEPFAR countries eight years ago, it's a very different story today. And there's not been that kind of effort made that must be made for us to understand uh, the evidence or find, get the evidence to show all of, all of what uh, is happening in the faith community and, and in other communities. So I think there are some small projects, but um, not to the scale that we would need to get the evidence that is necessary. Okay, um, I'm before I turn it back over to Steve, um, Kay, in in, uh, in the spirit of one of your comments, I know you said some of your team members were here. Yes. Yeah, I, I just wanted to all the audience members who are working um, in the AIDS movement as part of the faith space community to stand up so we could give them a round of applause. So I'd like to thank our panelists, and I think Steve is going to uh, close for us. On behalf of everyone here, please join me in thanking our panelists this afternoon. <laughs> You've been all very, very generous. Uh, Kay, thank you for coming such a long distance. Um, Ken, Kent, Anita, thank you so much for your time. And Diane, all of your leadership, in, along with Chris, in pulling together the plans for AIDS 2012 which I think is going to be a very successful gathering with a lot of key input from the faith community. So thank you all.